Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mr. Carlson's Lab. I hope all of you are doing well. These are some pretty odd times that we're living in, and I'm trying to get up as many videos as I can to keep all of you entertained. I realize that many of you are stuck at home, so hopefully these videos are making that just a little bit easier. I launched a video yesterday on the Panasonic RF4900 communications receiver, so if you haven't checked that out, definitely check that out as well. And if you've seen all the videos here, I have around another 90 videos up on Patreon right now with lots of projects that you can take part in and build. So there's a lot of really neat things going on, so definitely check that out. At any rate, today we're going to take a look at a Bogan amplifier. It's the Bogan DB130. Really neat looking amplifier. We'll take a look at the amp, see what we need to do to restore it in the future. We'll take a look at the schematic and go from there. So let's get started. Here's a look at the face of the Bogan DB130 audio amplifier, and as you can see, it's in really nice condition. Now, this is a monoblock amplifier, and I have the other channel as well, so it's an identical amplifier to this. And I plan on doing a restoration on one of these amplifiers, but if you're interested in seeing the restoration on both of them, you can let me know in the comments below. Chances are, the other amplifier is just going to be really a carbon copy of this one. But if you're interested in seeing both being restored, I will do a video on both of them. So the paint is held up pretty good. The gold is all still there. And, you know, for its age, it's actually quite surprising what good condition these things are in. These little gold cups that fit into the knobs here often go missing on many of these style of knobs. And it's really nice to see that all the little gold cups are there. I've had many of these amplifiers, not the particular Bogan, but many amplifiers with these types of knobs with this little kind of a gold shaped cup and they're missing. That is a real pain, especially if the, you know, all the knobs are original, but that little gold cup is missing. It really takes away from the amplifier. So that was one of the things that I was looking for when I actually looked at the face of both of these amplifiers. I wanted to make sure that everything was there, all the original knobs and everything, and they were. So to me, that's a, a really good selling point because I you know, want these things to look good, especially if they're going to be on display, right? All the knobs feel very positive here. And the switches, everything seems to feel really good. Again, this thing was used, I believe, right up to the point I, I bought it. Now, I wasn't sure if this thing was recapped, and a lot of the times these things aren't, and the owners use them when they're not recapped, and that's kind of touchy. You know, there's a, a really good chance that, you know, a transformer could go away or something like that. So I was more interested in shutting the thing off and just taking them since they both worked, and then I can work with what's there. So what we're going to do now is take a look at the top side, we'll take a look at the tubes and the tube layout, and then I'll flip the thing upside down, and we'll see if it has been recapped or whether it has all the original wax capacitors in it still. Here's a look at the top side of the chassis. It's pretty hard to shine light on this without getting some form of glare. Nice metallic gold paint here. Lots of adjustments. Adjust for minimum hum, impedance selector, damping factor, auxiliary one adjust, voltage regulator, balance... There's adjustments everywhere on here. Lots of jacks. So they obviously wanted to make this thing as universal as possible. Six AV5s are the power tubes right here. Lots of modifications for this to change these tubes out as well. I don't know if I'd want to do that. So it's kind of nice to run these things the way that they were intended. 5Y3 rectifiers right here. It says voltage regulator, so they're using a 6CG7 as a voltage regulator. These tubes are common in televisions way back when. 12AX7, 12AU7, another 12AX7 here. The controls look a little bit rusty, so they're going to probably use a cleaning. Other than that, you know, they seem to sound fine, you know, when he was playing this thing, so hopefully uh, it's, it's going to remain sounding fine. And obviously this is just coming apart right here. Wow, look at that. That's just decaying. So that'll be replaced. A little clip right there holding these coaxial cables. So all in all, on the top side, it's looking really nice as well. So let's take a look at the underside and see if this thing still has the waxies in it. That will be interesting. All right, I removed all the screws on the bottom side. So it's one here, 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 and here. And then you just slide this back and this comes out. And I can already see an old capacitor with a paper shell on it right here, so this isn't looking good. 
All right, are you ready? Let's see what's under here. Wow, it's looking pretty much original. Aside from this. Looking pretty good. Let's move this up. Maybe I can zoom on into that just a little bit more. Yes, lots of paper and foil capacitors everywhere. Good old capacitors, it says. So those will definitely have to go. Electrolytic down in here, here, and then of course these ones here will all have to be replaced. Well, it's looking pretty solid. In fact, you know what? Since the amplifier worked, this is nice to see because there hasn't been a whole lot of tampering with this. So that makes the I guess you could say the restoration of this quite a bit easier because a lot of the times people get into into these things and they you know they hack them up pretty bad. So that has got to be really close to the bottom panel. Let's see this one here. Ah, it is very close to the bottom panel. Looks like some liquid in there. Probably some wax. The capacitor, so if that was sitting here, that would be right where this capacitor is here. Yep. Those definitely have to go. I removed these tubes. I have this upside down, and if I don't remove the tubes, the amplifier's weight will be on the glass bulb, so I wanted to take these outs and outs on the actual transformers themselves. So these are the audio output tubes, and these are the rectifiers right here. That one terminal looks like it's burnt. Looks like maybe somebody hit that with their screwdriver or something. I don't know if you can see that. I'll zoom on in. Look at that. Some more light on that. Oh yeah, possibly. Doesn't look very good. We'll dive it over here. Wax has been melting and carrying over to nearby components. Let's zoom on out a little bit. So all in all, it is looking complete. No discoloration in the output transformer, which is a good sign. Usually when these things darken up or burn up, it's because this capacitor here, as you can see, ties right over here. And there's a 220k resistor and this one ties right over to here and there's a 220k resistor what does that tell us these are the coupling capacitors to the control grids of the 6av5s when these capacitors electrically leak it turns those tubes on and they draw heavy current well if these tubes draw heavy current what does it do to this well it pulls heavy current in the windings of the transformer and it burns up the audio transformer. So this is the audio transformer and this over here is a power transformer and it still looks really good. So that is a very good sign. So they may be leaky, but they haven't gotten to the point to where they've you know, completely burnt anything up. Now, anytime you see any type of a wax capacitor like this, you just get rid of them. You can sit and you can test them all and, you know, find out which ones are you know, less leaky than the others. But chances are what's going to happen is you're going to put on your favorite music. You're going to go grab your favorite beverage, whether it be a coffee or whatever. You're going to come back into the room and the room's going to be filled with smoke. And you know what that smoke's going to be from? Either this or this. Because when these things go bad and these things turn on heavy, it draws heavy current. Well, something has to feed heavy current to the tubes, and that's the power transformer. So this thing is feeding heavy current to this, and of course these tubes are turning on, and it's pulling current through the windings of this transformer, and there's a good chance it'll burn this up. So it's just not worth it. These capacitors nowadays, 0.1 microfarad capacitors, are incredibly cheap. You know, like they're you know not a big deal to replace. I have an entire list. Uh, verified components. I spent a lot of time verifying components and I have an entire list of verified capacitors to replace these on Patreon. So they have better ratings and their leakage is extremely low. So if you go there, definitely look for that list. It's a list of verified parts, I believe it is. There's actually two. There's two, uh, two separate videos with verified components in that I've you know, spent quite a bit of time verifying 
parts and pieces to make sure that they're good to share with everybody. Those are the ones that I use myself. So, yeah, definitely. These all have to go. No second guessing anything like that. The ceramic disc capacitors like this can stay. They very rarely fail. So when you see these, they can just be left alone. This one here will have to go as well. This electrolytic down here will have to go. I'll just zoom out here a little bit more so you can see that. This will have to go. So all the discs are fine. They can be left. And these here can be left. This is basically an early integrated circuit or printed circuit PC. And there's a whole conglomeration of resistors and capacitors in these little blocks right here. And they did that to make things more compact. So you can see this has got its fair share. There's one here and another one over here. This looks like one. This looks like one. So they're all over the place. So if they had to break this apart, basically you're turning this into a whole bunch of these resistors and these capacitors. So this is just saving a lot of space. And they started to do that way back when. Already the beginning of making things more compact, as you can see it in here. So this definitely looks like it's been leaking. Another electrolytic capacitor. This just looks like it's on the bias. So yes, positive end here, negative end over to this diode. So this would be the bias circuit over here. All right, let's take a look at the schematic and see what they've done. What have you done, Bogan? So here we have the power transformer here. We have a bunch of outlets here for accessories and we have a fuse here. So the fuse is after the outlets. You can see that these aren't fused at all. There's just a switch. And then there's a fuse in line with primary of the power transformer. This is the core of the transformer here. And this is the secondary of the transformer. So you can see we have center tap to ground here and we have a full wave configuration using two 5Y3 tubes. So these are double diodes inside here. And you can see what they've done is they've just tied both of the plates together. So they're using one tube on one end of the winding and they're using the other tube on the other end of the winding. Now I get this uh, question quite often. You'll see that there's a five volt AC winding here and it's powering up the filaments of these tubes here. And then, yet you'll see a DC voltage here, 610 volts DC. And then this powers the B plus for, you know, the unit here. So I get the question, well, isn't that 5 volts on here? And, you know, isn't there going to be hum or ripple in there? Because, you know, we have 5 volts here. There's, you know, 5 volts here and then 610 volts here. Well, this 5 volt AC winding only powers up the filament, so there's no complete circuit here. So basically, this just looks invisible to the rest of the circuit, and that's why you don't get that 5-volt AC hum happening here. It's isolated. It's just powering up these filaments, that's all. There's no connection other than the filaments. So that's why that works okay. So we have our DC here, and the DC, the 610, is coming from this winding here. You can see we have a tap for the bias over here, runs up to this diode. And then the back side of the diode, we have negative 55 volts, runs up over to here to a balance adjustment over here for the control grids of the 6AV5. And then the filter capacitor is here running to ground. So the positive side of the capacitor is running to the chassis. Remember, this is negative 55 volts, not positive 55. And then we have the center tap right here, which is grounding this. So basically what's happening is, you know, these tubes are going back and forth like this. They're switching like this in a full wave configuration. Now you can hook these up in multiple different ways. A lot of the times what they do is they'll tie the both plates on one side together and both plates on the other. So if one rectifier fails, it'll still have full wave rectification. This way, if one of the rectifiers fail, you only have one half working here. So this just all depends on the way you want to wire it up. That's all. Here are the filaments down at the bottom here. We can see 6.3 volts AC. This powers up the dial light and the tubes, and then we have a balance adjustment right here, which is to ground. This is a hum balance adjustment. So you move this back and forth until you get minimum hum at the speaker. So there's the least amount of buzz happening there. Now, a lot of the times they have a, an actual balanced filament system in the amplifiers. There's a center tap, and the center tap runs off to ground. But you'll find more often than not that when you have a balanced system, if you remove that center tap ground uh, winding, portion of the winding, you remove that from ground, and then you put a hum balance control in, you know, uh, for example, uh, 
a standard value, something 500 ohms or something like that, across the you know 6.3 volt AC filament line, and then you run the center tap to ground, you can really fine tune that. So you can really get rid of the hum. There might be a bit of buzz with a center tap, but this allows you just to really fine tune it. So I like the hum balance control better than an actual center tap filament system or balanced filament system. So our B plus runs up over to here and we have our 6CG7 as a voltage regulator over here. So, so this is acting as a pass element. So our B plus you can see goes into the plate and then of course we have our cathode here and this is going to run out to the screen grids of the 6AV5s. Now it's very important to have a regulator on the screens or regulated screen grid voltage for very low distortion. That's a one of the reasons that they've actually put a voltage regulator in here. Now this is a very simple regulator, it doesn't have a reference or anything like that, but it's effective enough to keep distortion down. So what's happening here is we have the B plus on the plate. So what happens is when a grid goes positive, all right, so if you just, uh, for example, you feed a positive voltage in here, what's going to happen is inside the tube, it's going to want to try to connect the plate to the cathode. Okay, so basically what's happening is if you look at this like a resistor, the more positive you put, the more positive voltage you put on that grid here, what it's trying to do is, is basically taking like a variable resistor and turning the resistance down to almost no resistance. Okay, so, so say we're starting at something like 10k ohms. So the more positive you turn this, it would go down to maybe 5k ohms or 1k ohm. And then the more negative, it will go back up to 10 or maybe even 20, depending, uh, K ohms. So what's happening is a very easy way of looking at this is the more positive that you make the grid, it tries to connect the plate to the cathode harder. Okay, so it allows the tube to conduct harder. So electrons flow from the cathode to the plate. All right, so this is the cathode. This is the portion that glows inside the vacuum tube. All right, so there's a filament in the middle, and the filament is, of course, the primary part that glows, but what it does is that's hiding in that cathode sleeve. And what happens is that cathode sleeve gets hot and emits electrons, and that's what this little C-shaped thing is right here. So whenever you see these little C-shaped things in the tubes, that's the part that's actually glowing that you see, that little pipe in the center of the tube. In the actual filament, or in the actual cathode itself is the filament, and these are the filaments, but they're illustrated or drawn down here, okay? So what's happening here, as you can see, we have our full 610 on the plate of this 6CG7, and then the cathode runs over here to the screen grids. All right, so what do they want on the screens? Do they actually tell the screen voltage here? Eh, they're being cryptic about that. I'm imagining it's going to be a couple hundred volts or something like that at any rate. So when it comes time to do the actual alignment, we'll find all of this stuff out. So what's happening is, is we have our full plate voltage here, and then you'll see we have a one meg ohm resistor, again, from the full plate voltage to this plate over here. So you could call this a very lightly coupled plate to this one over here. This one meg ohm resistor is a very soft value. You can see that they have a voltage divider right here. So there's a voltage divider out to the output here and then right up to the, the, the plate line of the 6CG7. Now you'll notice that this runs off to a variable resistor and then this runs off to our negative bias line, okay? Because our negative voltage will shut this tube off and of course positive on the grid will turn it on. So what they're doing with this VR is they're looking for a balance point through this voltage divider across this. So when you move this around, say you, say just for example sake, okay, say this is uh, supposed to be 200 volts or something like that, okay? 200, 250, something like that. All right, so we'll say 200. Say it's supposed to be 200 volts here. So what's going to happen is, is if the supply voltage drops, Okay, so say the supply voltage bogs down because you're playing some really loud music, right? Well, the voltage at this point here is higher than the voltage at this point here. Okay, so if the voltage at this point drops down, this is going to go more negative, right? Because we have our negative supply here, so this is going to go more negative. If this goes more negative, 
What's going to happen is it's going to shut this portion of the tube off and it's going to allow the voltage at this point to climb higher. If the voltage climbs higher at this point, it's going to turn this tube on more and supply more current. You see what's happening? So again, we have 610 volts here and then this is coupled through a 1 meg resistor. It's a very soft value. So technically you could take this 1 meg resistor and you could actually short that to ground. Okay, the resistor might get a little hot, but you could remove it and it would go right from zero right up to however many volts this is actually drawing across this right now, whatever this is sitting at. So it's a very, very soft value. So what's happening is, is that, of course, positive voltage turns this on. So this is obviously going to be conducting, right, because we have our voltage divider here and we have a balance point. So it's going to be sitting at a balance. If the high voltage drops down, again, this, right, if this is going to go down here, this is going to go more negative, right, because this here is 600 volts or 610, and this is, say, around 200 or something, right? So if this drops down, we can look at this as going up, okay? So if our negative voltage raises at this point, if this raises, it's going to shut this tube off more. Well, if it shuts this tube off, What's going to happen? Well, the voltage at this point is going to go high, right? Because if the tube is conducting, it's pulling this towards ground, it's going to pull it down. Well, if the tube shuts off, this is going to go high. If this goes high, it turns this on, and then this will pass more current to supply to the screens. And that's how this voltage regulator works. I hope that's clear enough. At any rate, very, very simple circuit. No, you know real reference or anything like that but it's good enough because they're using it from the screen section here you can see the screens and then they're tying it up to the actual b plus section here so it should be pretty good enough to work for this amplifier not to to be too big of a deal you know we're not dealing with any time bases or anything in here right so we have our phase inverter circuit over here so we should see one plate tying over here to a coupling cap there's one there and we can see the other plate over here tying to the other coupling cap right here. So we have our phase inverter circuit here, right? And we have a bunch of amplification stages over here. And then you see these little dotted areas? This is most likely one of those PC, like those little uh, uh, integrated circuit or printed circuit cards that we were looking at there. So these are all the components inside. Not a whole lot of components, but they're inside. So that's usually what they mean when they put a little dotted line around these things here. And selector switches and just amplification stages. So the way you look at this is really quite simple. Signal in the grid, out the plate. In the grid. So it's getting amplified here, right? So a lot of people think that tubes are magic. Well, they're not. All they're doing is they're taking the high voltage that the transformer and the rectifiers are creating. And they're recreating the audio that you're putting on the grid. So say your record player or your CD player or whatever is feeding a signal into the grid, okay? What's happening is, is that's turning this tube on and off and on and off. So you're getting your sine wave. Well, as it turns the tube on, it's pulling this down. You see the soft resistor here again, right? It's going to pull this towards ground. And then when the music gets quiet, of course, it's, you know, it's not going to be driving the grid as positive, and you know we're going to get a rise, and it, depending on where on the cycle it is, it's going to cause this to be basically just turning on and off. So what's going to happen is this, when we have a positive voltage here, it's going to pull this down, all right? So this is going to get pulled towards the cathode, and then when this goes negative, this is going to shut off, right, on the negative portion of the cycle, this is going to shut off, and then this is going to swing back up again. So what do we get? We get an inverted signal at this point. So we get signal inversion in this stage. And then it happens here again, and it gets inverted again. So technically, at this point, we're back to what we had at this point again. They'll be in phase. So as this is rising here, this will be going down. So these will be like this. And then it'll go in here, and then they'll become the same again. And if it was to go into this, it would get inverted again, and then it would be the same again, and it would get inverted again, and it would be the same again, depending on how many stages you have linked together. So that's how that works. And that's the same thing with a transistor. If you have an NPN transistor and, you know, you turn the transistor on, well, what's it going to try and do? If you want to look at it simply, it's going to try and connect the collector to the emitter, right? So it's going to pull the collector down towards the emitter if it's connected to ground. So anything that's driving the base, you put a positive signal on, it's going to pull the collector down. And then if you 
of course, you know, take the current off of the base of the transistor, it's going to go back up again. So you're going to get this inversion. Transistors are current driven devices, whereas FETs are much more like vacuum tubes. FETs are voltage driven devices, just like tubes. That's why a lot of people prefer FETs over standard, you know, bipolar NP and PNP transistors. That's a completely other topic. We'll get into that sometime as well. Lots of selector switches. This looks like this would be a real pain to figure out if somebody <laughs> took some of the wires off and changed some components. That would be a real pain to figure out, but thankfully this is all together. You can see here we have another one of these dotted little blocks. So it's another one of those little, little cards with wires coming out of it. Another one over here. So those are the ones that we're seeing. Audio output stage over here. Audio output transformer. Damping factor. Simply variable feedback. So that's what that is. We have damper indicator. I and mean, they're getting pretty, pretty fancy here. That was the bulb that was missing on the back. So the damper indicator bulb, which is a neon here. That's pretty much it in a nutshell. I could stay here and, you know, go over this and you know, really, really tear this apart. But that really is the, you know, I guess the, the bottom line of the whole thing here. It's a nice design. You know, it looks really nice. I don't have anything bad to say about it. They did a really nice job. Really nice, simple voltage regulator circuit. I like that. I like the simplicity in that. And, uh, you know, two 5Y3s to really strengthen up the supply to really give this thing a lot of current. And I would imagine it would up the B plus quite a bit too is to replace these with diodes. Some newer type diodes at B plus would probably go way up and you'd have to fool with the bias here. And then of course this would probably put out quite a bit more power. So this is the bias over here. This is negative 55 volts. And we can move that back and forth to balance things out. As you can see, balance adjustment, 25k ohms. So yeah, lots of voltage on the plates of these 6AV5, 605 volts. And I imagine that there is a fair amount of current there. You definitely would not want to come across this B plus line. That would be a very, very bad day possibly permanently lots of current being supplied here and of course we have our those are the capacitors that are in series here that would be those two small ones on the top side of the chassis that should have shells on them right here so there'd be a lot of current there and we have some storage here as well so you got to be careful I should warn you, if you're ever going to work on something like this and you're new to this, you really want to do your research before you go poking your fingers around in, in here because if, if you ever came across this line, you'd have a really bad day. There is a lot of current and there's a lot of voltage available here that would uh, throw you across your room and possibly be even worse than that. So uh, you know, if you're following along and you're going to work on one of these things, you're definitely doing so at your own risk. Just be very, very careful. There's a, a lot of voltage and current present in here. You know, like, I mean, there's you know, 610 here, negative 55 here. You know, I imagine the screens are going to be somewhere, probably 200, 250, something like that, I'm guessing. I'd have to look into that. It's probably written somewhere on the chassis or something like that. So, uh, yeah, be very careful if you're going to ever work on something like this. This one is kind of extreme, you know, 610 volts on the, you know, on the B plus line and 605 on the plates of the 6AV5s. It's um, definitely uh, definitely uh, work in that section, that's for sure. If you're into audio amplifiers or custom building audio amplifiers, what I'm about to show you is going to be very, very interesting. So what you see here is a project that is up to about part six right now on Patreon. So this little amplifier right here, as you can see, very nice looking little guitar amplifier. It's very well put together. I've gone through the inside and talked about the circuitry that's in there and everything. As you can see right here in the stock version, so that's the way this was purchased. This is the way it comes right here. There's a, an audio IC inside here. In fact, these two screws hold the heat sink for that audio IC inside. This amplifier right here is being converted to this amplifier right here. This is the Mr. Carlson's lab version. It's much heavier. As you can see, it's now a vacuum tube guitar amplifier. 
and this amplifier sounds incredible. So right now, this is at part six on Patreon. So there's many, many parts. I'll go through this step by step. And the next part is going to be the last part. It's the completion of this project. So there are people up there building along. And these amplifiers are actually very reasonably priced. So a very nice build. And as I say, the amplifier, it just sounds incredible. Night and day difference to the other one. This is a very unique tube right here that I'm using. And it's, I guess you could say it's kind of undiscovered in the audio world. It's a, a modulator tube, or it's used in high frequency RF service. Inside this one glass envelope is a dual tetrode. So this is running in push-pull, and this is driving this audio transformer right here. Get a little bit more light on that so you can see it. It's a fairly large audio transformer right here. This is the phase inverter right here, and then there's one amplifier stage, which I've also added on the inside underneath the chassis here. So that is the project. If you're into custom building audio amplifiers with unique vacuum tubes and looking for that specific sound, this is definitely the project that you'd be interested in. And there's many more of these coming. I have some absolutely huge bogan amplifiers they've got really really large audio output transformers i think they were used in theater service a long long time ago at any rate those are going to be converted as well into some very neat projects so lots of learning lots of very interesting projects coming up on patreon this is just one of them right here if you're enjoying these videos, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and hang around. There'll be many more videos like this coming in the near future. We'll be taking a look at vacuum tube and solid state electronic devices alike. So there'll be a lot of restorations coming as well. So if you haven't subscribed, now would be a good time to do that as well. And if you want to be notified as soon as I post a new video, don't forget to tap the bell symbol. If you're interested in taking your electronics knowledge to the next level and learning electronics in a very different and effective way and gaining access to many of my personal inventions and designs, and there's also another 90 videos there as well, you're definitely going to want to check out my ongoing electronics course on Patreon. I'll put the link just below the video's description under the show more tab, and I'll also pin the link at the top of the comments section. So click on the link and it'll take you right there. All right, until next time. Take care. Bye for now.